was in my late teens and early 20s, I kept my religious faith as a very closely guarded secret. It was only the people, the friends and family who were closest to me, who I trusted the most, who knew that being a follower of Jesus was really important to me. Now, maybe this doesn't seem all that strange because when we're at that stage of life, when we're just entering into adulthood, we're really still trying to figure out who we are and what we believe, and maybe we don't go around articulating those things out loud for other people to hear. I think what was unusual about my circumstance, though, is that at that stage in my life, I was pretty sure that God was calling me to be an Anglican priest. And I was just right around the corner from entering seminary, studying divinity, and beginning a whole living articulating religious faith. I was pretty intentional about why I kept this as a closely guarded secret. It's because when I looked at the world around me, I didn't necessarily like what the most vocal Christians out there were saying. I didn't necessarily feel like their beliefs aligned with mine. I heard a lot of Christian proclamation that sounded to me like hatred and condemnation. And it seemed like when Christians were in the headlines, they were in the headlines for bad things and abusive things. And I didn't necessarily want to align my life with theirs or to proclaim my faith from the rooftops. Now, if I'm being kind of judgmental about my younger self, I would say that there's a bit of a character flaw that has run through my entire life, which is that I'm naturally quite a people pleaser, and I probably think a little too much about what other people think of me, and I think that held me back from being braver about my faith. If I were going to be more charitable and generous toward my younger self, and you know, usually there's an argument to be made for charity and generosity. I would say that I just didn't know how to do it. I didn't know how to talk about my faith in a way that might invite conversation and dialogue and reflection and sharing. I didn't know how to articulate my faith in a way that wouldn't sound condemning or toxic or shut the door on dialogue. I didn't know, and maybe I had to learn. In today's gospel passage, Jesus asks his disciples a question, who do people say that I am? And we need to pay attention to the answers that start to bubble up because they're very telling. Some people think that Jesus is John the Baptist. Now that's a bit of a weird answer because John the Baptist has just died. So I guess that people thought that maybe his spirit had leapt from his dead body into Jesus' body, which seems like something that doesn't happen a lot. Other people think that Jesus might be Elijah or Jeremiah or one of the other prophets, and the theme in all of these answers is that they're all dead guys. So apparently what people think Jesus is is some reincarnation of something that God has already done. And I think that we can see in these answers a very classic religious mistake, which is to think that the pages of Holy Scripture are a closed book and that what God has done in the past is done and dusted and that all is left for us in religious faith is the recycling of some old ideas. Jesus obviously isn't that impressed by any of these answers and so he tries again. He says to the disciples gathered in front of him, who do you say that I am? 
And Simon Peter, one of the disciples, has a very Simon Peter moment. And I've talked about this before. Simon Peter is really known for his blustery bravado. Simon Peter is the guy who leaps and then looks, who acts and speaks and then thinks. In this moment, though, it kind of works to his favor. And so we get this delightful moment of seeing that there's really an upside to following your gut instinct and not overthinking things. Because Simon Peter's response is right on the money. He says, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus is the Messiah, the anointed one of God. He is anointed, he is chosen, he is claimed for the purpose of revealing God's salvation. God's salvation that people have been waiting for. God's salvation which has been promised to all of the world. And what is it that that salvation looks like? Well, that is very much connected to the second part of, Jesus, of Peter's answer. You are the son of the living God. Not the God of old ideas, not the God who's done and dusted, not the God who's just rehashing and recycling something that's already happened, the living God. This living God is embodied and revealed in Jesus, and this living God is forever connected to our human lives in Jesus. Jesus is very complimentary toward Peter for his answer. And Jesus, in fact, praises Peter for being able to follow his gut instinct in that moment. That in that following of his gut instinct, Peter is able to dial in to a spiritual truth. The Holy Spirit is able to work in Peter in order to reveal this truth. And Jesus says... You are a rock. That's what the nickname Peter means, rock. You are the rock, and on this rock, I am going to build my church. And Jesus invests in this church, in this community of faith, enormous power. Jesus invests in this community of faith the power to be part of how evil will be vanquished and how all of creation will be set free from the powers of evil, from the powers of destruction that bind us up and hurt and harm us. Jesus builds this church on this rock. And because of this particular moment, Simon Peter has always had a kind of special and privileged position among the disciples and in the life of the church. He has been seen as a leader among leaders. He has been seen as that special person who's the, the rock of the church. And depending on my mood, I can either feel kind of hopeful about that or disappointed. Sometimes I feel a little bit disappointed because sometimes I don't always relate to the blustery bravado of Peter. Sometimes I think Jesus could have selected somebody a little steadier to single out in this way. But when I'm feeling more hopeful, I see in Simon Peter kind of a mixed bag of good and bad and lots of flaws. And then I look at myself and I see a mixed bag of good and bad and lots of flaws. And so it seems like a pretty hopeful thing that God could do powerful things in somebody like Peter, somebody imperfect like Peter, and maybe God can do some things in somebody imperfect like me too. Now, all of that being said, I do have to say that as I was preparing for today's sermon, I did some reading 
that revealed something to me that I hadn't heard before about this passage, which is that if you go back to the original Greek and you look at that grammar, it seems to be the case that what Jesus is actually saying is not that he is going to build his church on the rock that is the person of Peter, but that he's building his church on the rock of what Peter articulates, the revelation of the living God embodied in Jesus. That is the rock on which Jesus is going to build this church. The rock that is the God, not of the dead, not of the recycled, not of the done and dusted, but of the alive and the new. That's the rock on which Jesus is going to build this church. That rock also includes the spirit of God speaking through Peter in that moment. That's the rock on which Jesus is going to build this church. And guess what? Jesus is going to build this church on the rock that is the whole community of faith being invested with the power to participate in God's work and participate in God's kingdom and participate in the new thing that God is doing. That's the rock on which this church is going to be built. Jesus says to his disciples, who do you say that I am? I think back to my late teens, early 20s self, and I tend to err on the side of compassion for my younger self, that I didn't know what I didn't know. I didn't know how to talk about my faith, but also, I take this question that Jesus asks seriously because I think it is a call to all of us as people of faith to be able to give account of the faith that is in us. But maybe we have to learn how to do that. And maybe we have to learn from one another. And I think that if anything, that the past 20 plus years have taught me in ministry is that maybe one of the most powerful and inviting and generous ways of talking about our faith is to be able to talk about how the living God has been alive in us. That is to be able to tell our stories of where God has been alive and doing something new in us. And so I ask you these questions. Where has God been alive in you and in your life? Where have you experienced grace or forgiveness that you didn't earn? Where have you been surprised by love? Where have you drawn on a strength and a peace that didn't come from within you? Where have you experienced that still, small voice within guiding you and leading you? Where have you known generosity and compassion and healing that's hard to explain? Where has something impossible become possible? Where have you seen good come out of bad? Where have you seen life? come out of death? Where have you experienced that catch in the back of your throat where you're just overcome for a moment with the wonder of the universe around us? What's articulated in Peter's proclamation today is a promise. The promise is that the living God is showing up is showing up in each of our lives and in our life together and in the lives beyond the life of the church. The living God is showing up in the whole wide world and maybe this can be such an important part of the offering of the church 
is to lift up those stories. Because the truth is, is that the living God is doing something new in each of us and in the whole world. But sometimes we have to learn how to have eyes to see and how to have words to speak that truth. Amen.